Hello again. Welcome back to another installment of Ask Eddie and Anne. Anne Hawkins, Director of Communications of the Film Noir Foundation, is here with me today, as is, that is Charlotte, I take it, who's a little fuzzy. Today. Okay, a little fuzzy body I see there next to you on the couch. Uh, okay, Anne, this is going to be a weird show. Uh, I, I just want, I'm giving everybody advance warning, it's going to be a weird one because it's been a very strange week. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff is going on. And uh, so let, let's get it started because it's all going to come out in the course of human events. Okay, and this one is <laughs> from Christy. In anticipation for the upcoming Noor City, I thought it would be fun to hear one of your favorite moments or memories from a previous Noor City. Thanks in advance, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Uh, well, okay, we might as well just say... One of the things that's weird is we're not at this as of this moment we're not entirely sure there is going to be this noir city uh, coming up. I mean we're we're on the we have already stopped selling advance tickets because we want to hold capacity at fifty percent so that there's social distancing. This is the event at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, Noir City nineteen. Uh, but as of now, I mean, I'm getting a lot of information that we should just postpone. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. And I, I can't, while we're, we obviously we record this in advance. So, uh, there will probably be something definitive by the time this airs and we'll be able to make an announcement in conjunction with this, this posting or broadcast or whatever, but it's weird. And just to show you how weird it all is, and um, my wife, Kathleen, has tested positive for COVID. Oh, no. And, uh, and I am negative, and we are in the same house. And now we are, she is quarantined, and I am quarantined from her in my own house. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. So I am upstairs, and she is downstairs, and... I have to mask up to go downstairs and everything. And it's just like, oh my God. It's, you know, this is the first time, you know, that she has tested. And, and you know, she's vaccinated and boosted yeah. and everything, as am I. But something, you know, she she got the, you know, the new variant, the Omicron variant has apparently gotten her. And, uh, you know, so we're just seeing how that all goes. So... Um, you know, and just the other day we did a whole walkthrough of the, of the venue and it was, everybody was so excited and, and it reminds me exactly of when we had to shut down Noir City in Hollywood in 2020, uh, you know, when this first happened, it was just like, we were just going and everything was great. And then it was like, wait a second. This thing is happening, and then there were like three concentrated days of what do we do, and we, and it was like, well, we can't, we can't proceed, and then uh, you know, so I thought we were coming out of it, but who knows? We'll find out. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a that's just a, a, a <laughs> part of what's going on here. That's not the question that Christy asked about great memories. Um, do, do you have any that are that? Because you've been to all the Noir City shows in, in San Francisco. Oh, no, I haven't been. I did, didn't go to the first couple, actually. Oh, okay. okay. So I came in a little later. Um, I think for, oh, God, it's so hard to tell. Um, I, I know. Just, we've had a lot of fun stuff go on. Yeah. Yeah. I still think the Dash, the five Dashiell Hammett films in one day is still my favorite memory <laughs> of, <laughs> of Noir City. <laughs> Um, because we had had the nightclub the night before and I just remember being in my seat completely exhausted and going, oh, these films are so rare, I've got to watch them. Yeah, the opportunity to see Roadhouse Nights, uh, which <laughs> I can't believe we found that and, and got a print that we could show, and Mr. Dynamite. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, yeah, that was really something. That was, that. Yeah. I'm, uh, that's an interesting memory. Yes. And you'll recall that we did the nightclub the night before and I mm -hmm. came and did the whole, I never went to bed. Yeah. I so I, I did the whole show in my soiled tuxedo <laughs> the next day. Uh, yeah, that was, those were the old days. Those yeah. were the old days. I don't think I could do that again, but 
I, I, I don't know. I've had many wonderful moments. I, I guess, uh, well, the Peggy Cummins uh, gun crazy thing was really, really special. Um, you know, but I don't want to pick one guest over another, but that was very special just because Peggy, Peggy came the furthest of anybody who's ever come to do the show, right? Yeah. All the way from England. And, and, you know, she came on her own by herself and, and she was just so wonderful and the event came off so well. And, and the fact that she, you know, I'd see her later in, at her flat in London and she had the poster from that event on the wall as soon as you walked in to her apartment that was the first thing that you saw and she said well you know that was like one of the great nights if not the greatest night of my professional life you know so yeah. that was very sweet I don't I don't think she like threw it up there because she knew I was coming and no, you know, no because uh, when, she, when she was on stage um, I just remember her saying that she felt like Cinderella. That yeah. she was at the the ball. And the next day, she'd wake you know wake up and be back to normal life. And I was just so moved by that that she was so happy to be there, and it meant so much to her. Yeah. That that totally expressed the kind of person that Peggy was. Uh, I, I I know exactly that moment. She said, "I'm just so moved because you know this is so wonderful," and then in two days time i'll be back in my flat like cleaning potatoes you know and <laughs> no. and doing the dishes and stuff she was just so adorable and, and sweet the 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 other one really quick is uh when we did a christmas show uh and showed blast of silence <sighs> with alan Barron. that uh, that was really great for reasons that people wouldn't know it's that alan got really really cranky before the show and i don't know what happened i mean we met the night before and had dinner and we really hit it off and everything was great but something kind of really was bothering him the night of the show and he actually he said i'm really cold and he went to sit in the car outside and it was like oh my god he's he's being really you know cantankerous in a way but then, and I totally credit the audience for this, you know, when the movie was over and he came on stage, the audience reaction was just so immense that it completely changed everything. And he ended up having the best time ever, you know, and, and he said, you know, that was just, that's as good a screening of that movie as I've ever experienced. He said, that was just amazing. And uh, so, so that was really great. And I give all the credit to the audience for that because um you know that's it was very special yeah, anyway, and i was just are. gonna say oh one more thing was i i think one of the great ones for me was when uh monica um heinrich paul heinrich's daughter yeah uh and she told the story behind the two cigarettes thing because from now voyager which is one of my favorite films my favorite romance film and that that was her parents when they would drive. And that was just like also one of my favorite moments just because it just also really drew such a picture of that type of long-term marriage and, and those kind of gestures that happen between married couples and how that's, you know, that, well, that's why it worked so well in the film. So it was I know, I know. That was wonderful. Monica was great. I've done, yeah. I've done several uh, things with her and she was really, she's terrific uh, uh you know talking about her dad and and i love don't you just love stuff like that yeah. like something a, a moment on screen that's so iconic as the the lighting of the cigarettes and, and then you know the revelation that it was just a thing that he did that he said oh let, let's try this you know yeah. how about if we did this and it becomes this cultural thing you know yeah. I, I i absolutely love love it when that stuff when we learn that stuff okay uh okay here we go uh marjorie and arlene uh both asked about the process of restoring too late for tears um so we've taken these two questions and sort of melded them into one 
Yeah. Because Arlene wants to know, like, uh, what are the factors that go into us deciding what we're going to restore? So um, I will I will just quickly answer that and say, um, you know, it, the movie has to be entertaining. <laughs> I mean, it has to it has to have value as a piece of entertainment. Number one. Then, then we're looking for historical significance and rarity. Those two things go hand in hand, right? Like because the film is historically significant, but why is it not available? That's like, that's the key thing. And then of course we decide based on, you know, our efforts to find sufficient material that we can use to restore the film. Um, then, so th those are the main factors. But then uh, it was either Marjorie or Arlene mentioned that she had seen the film on Paramount Plus on the, the streaming channel, Paramount Plus, and, and asked, how did you get Paramount to agree to let us restore the film? Well, the reality is Paramount has nothing to do with it it's paramount is actually licensing our restoration from Flickr alley right who we we produce all of these the the digital versions of our restorations are all done with Flickr alley and so paramount uh plus has licensed that Flickr alley product as part of its streaming service so uh, we're, we're not paying paramount anything paramount is paying us uh, and we do not buy the rights to any film that, that we have restored. We Rights are a big issue because you don't want to get in, you don't want to get in a situation where you are, are restoring a film that you do not have the rights to uh, or someone else has the rights to because it can get very, sticky so too late for tears is actually a public domain movie uh but the restoration we own the restoration right there are other much worse versions of that film that you can watch on youtube or something but the restored version is its own thing it's a separate artifact that we own the rights to so um, that, that's how that works. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Um, I, I mean, we get this every so often and I, I always do like to answer it because there are uh, people who are kind of new to all of this, new members of the foundation who might not understand how the process works. Um, you know, we, in the past we have restored in 35 millimeter films that are owned by a studio because they don't have a 35 millimeter print and it's obvious they're not going to make a 35 millimeter print. Uh, we've done that with stuff like Southside 1, 1000 and The Window uh, and Loophole and films like that because we wanted to show them in 35 millimeter at our festivals. Well, that's kind of changing because the landscape of the business is changing so dramatically. So the odds of us doing that again are are very, very slight. Um, it's better to restore something that we can eventually put out as a digital product um, because who knows when we're gonna be back in movie theaters and yeah. watching film, right? So. Um, that's, that's the answer for Marjorie and Arlene. And I just wanted to say, um, two things. One, that the, uh, UCLA Film and Television Archive are the people that actually do the restoration work on our films, um, just to give them a shout out. And then also yes. that we're able to restore films because people donate to the Film Noir Foundation. I mean, that's really our... And so just to let people know that when you donate to us and when we have a festival, our proceeds from it, that goes to our restoration work. Trust me, we're not, we're not driving in Cadillacs. <laughs> no, no. We and have I have very, to, and... very little overhead, like. <laughs> 
it is sort of miraculous and it but but i appreciate very much you're saying that ann because that is absolutely true uh and I'm so grateful to the people who have continued to donate uh, during the pandemic when we don't have festivals and we can't make money that way. Uh, it's been really gratifying to see people hanging in there and uh, providing, uh, you know, funding in, in, you know, spectacularly. And, you know, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, you know. I, I always say you know it it's not how much it's like how much that person can afford to give so somebody who gives us 20 bucks really is like skipping something you know it's a sacrifice for some yeah. people you know so it it is hugely appreciated and uh you know this is a very fluid thing that we've created and uh, obviously at the beginning it was all about preserving everything as film and you know like the new one argyle secrets i'm happy has been restored as a film and digitally at the same time cuz cuz now we know that you know the the market for noir digitally is really strong it's mm -hmm. like the, it, it's like you know, that's why you see Kino putting out all these titles as film noir, even stuff that isn't film noir. Kino is putting it out as film noir because that's what sells in the market now. And, and you know, that's terrific. So, uh, you know, advance orders on the um, restored version of repeat performance have been very, very good. And the Argentinian films uh, were very, very strong. And so all, all that is is terrific and is really helping compensate for the fact that uh, we haven't had festivals. Yeah, and one more time, I'm going to say it, but Repeat Performance is still my favorite film that we've restored. I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I just showed it, you know, last uh, earlier this month on yeah. TCM, and it, it, I, you know, you, you get so deep into this sometimes, you kind of forget what you're doing. Like, like, I'm just so involved in all this now. It's just like what I do. And then the, I turned it on when TCM was showing it. And I was like, damn, this looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, I had something to do with that. That was pretty good. So, uh, yes, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful when everything goes the right way. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, this is from Mike's DVD in Blu-ray collection and also Patrick. Uh, question, why is the film The Prowler so hard to find and why is it not more widely known? <laughs> well, this question kind of breaks my heart, you know. I know. Uh, uh, because The Prowler was the, the very first film that we restored at the Film Noir Foundation. Uh, you know, I, I don't know where uh, Mike and Patrick are are coming in on all this whether because the the reality is we restored the prowler years ago like 14 or 15 years ago now or more uh in 35 millimeter and then it was eventually uh put out as a as a dvd and then a blu-ray by vci entertainment not flicker alley and there's a convoluted reason for that um, and then, you know, they sold through. I mean, all of those sold. And and we ended up, the Film Noir Foundation ended up buying the, the remaining stock of the film when VCI went out of business. And we've sold all of those. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of why it's hard. And, and that is a film, I mean, this goes back to the earlier question. We do not own the rights to the Prowler. It is owned by um, the estate of Sam Spiegel, right? And a company that that handles all of those films. And, you know, we'd love to bring it back and do it again through Flickr Alley, but it's a little, a little tricky because 14 or 15 years ago, nobody knew what the Prowler was and there wasn't this market that there is now and now it's like oh wow you've already sold out 
all the DVDs and all the Blu-rays. And then all of a sudden, the owners are like, we can make some money with this. And it's like, well, I, you know, you're, you're not asking for a fair deal here. So I know I shouldn't be discussing this kind of stuff <laughs> in public, but, but it is an explanation as to, as to why it suddenly disappeared again. But, um, you know, it, it, it'll show up again on TCM and, uh, if you love that film as much as I do, I would suggest if you can't get your hands on, you don't want to pay the used Blu-ray price for it, uh, make sure you record it when it's on TCM. Yeah, and, <laughs> and we're actually also showing it at uh, North City 19. If North City 19 if, if happens, it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, will be, it will be part of the program. Exactly, exactly. Okay, uh, our friend Michael in Post Falls, Idaho, who is always good for a question and an episode. Uh, Michael says uh, that he occasionally searches YouTubes, YouTubes. <laughs> I occasionally search the interwebs for <laughs> movies uh, that IMDb categorizes as film noir. And he recently ran across I Love Trouble, uh, which he liked very much. Uh, but he was unable to fully enjoy it because of the quality of the copy. Okay, I understand completely where you're coming from, Michael. Uh, it, and he asked the, our assessment of the film, and do you think it would be a good candidate for preservation, uh, provided the elements necessary are available? Uh, and do you know the, the movie, I Love Trouble? Yeah, I saw it at our festival because we did, we did a 35 millimeter print of it. it because we showed it. That's right. Yeah. And it, and it is a it is a beautiful looking it's print. It's a beautiful of the film. beautiful yeah. print, yeah. And it's a fun film. It's a very very fun movie. Uh written by uh Roy Huggins and it introduces the character of Stuart Bailey played by Franco Tone in the film who would go on to become the lead character of 77 Sunset Strip, which was created by Roy Huggins in the 1950s. Uh, and it's and it's got all these fabulous actresses in it. It's just yeah. one after another. Uh, okay, so the deal with that is that's not something that we would restore because it is a Columbia picture and it is owned by Sony. And Sony uh, preserved what they had but what they had if my memory serves was missing the main titles for for whatever reason and and you have to understand a lot of times the situation is these films are independently produced movies that are distributed by a major studio and i believe that was the case with i love trouble so uh Sony may not have owned the original negative of the film, but they had prints of the film and things, you know, that uh, that they struck their release prints from, or, or you know, they had a dupe negative, something, who knows what. It, it, it's always on a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, that's it. The, the producers go kaput, but the distributor, in this case, Columbia, still had a copy of the movie. But somewhere along the line, whatever they had lost the main titles. And so until that gets restored, uh, they're probably not going to put it out through their own thing. And, and uh, Sony has pretty much stopped producing uh, DVD and Blu-ray products of their older films which is why you're seeing a lot of the stuff that did come out 10 years ago in the Columbia Noir collection is now being resold to other DVD companies, uh, you know, like Arrow in the UK and some other ones are, are licensing those Sony products to put them out again in Blu-ray packages. But I don't know, there she is. Wow, we got a double header today. You got both the twins. The twins are there. Um, so, so that's the story with uh, I Love Trouble. It's uh, the Film Noir Foundation won't get involved in that because the material, <laughs> the material exists. It's in the it's in good hands, but somebody has to convince uh, Sony that they have to rebuild the title sequence and uh, and then put it out as a Blu-ray or something. 
Uh, oh, I see. So th this is Emily. Yes. And Charlotte was like, I'm not sharing the screen with that cat. And so Actually, she just- Actually, Charlotte's over on the other side of my coffee table having a hairball, so. <laughs> oh, okay, very good. I'm sure we'll pick up the sound on that. That'll be good. I know. I'm hoping it won't come across. Okay. Okay, uh, so I've observed the foundation is making new 35 millimeter prints of classic noir films. I, as a private film collector, have had around 20 noirs on 60 millimeter and have occasionally been privileged to give public screenings. While the film versus digital is hotly debated at the highest level, do you personally think that the true noir experience can only be fully appreciated by watching it on a big screen with an image provided by real film on a projector rather than pixels? Your obedient servant, Christopher Sheffield. Oh, or Christopher in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Right, in Sheffield. United um, Kingdom. Well, you know, this is what I what I was saying earlier, uh, Christopher. Um, uh, everything is fluid. So 10 or 12 years ago, I would have said, we are all about 35 millimeter and 35 millimeter is the only way to watch a film. And while I still believe that that is the optimal way to do it, uh, I mean, things are changing so dramatically and drastically that, you know, I don't I don't want to be the anachronism. You know, I'm only going to watch 35 millimeter and everything else is BS, because when all of that came in and people started saying, oh, we really want you to show the digital version, the digital version was terrible. It yeah. was horrible. And you could see the pixelation and the shadows and stuff. And it was it was awful. And now it's not. Now they've really figured out how to do this. And it's the evolution, right? I would, I think it will become an exceptional thing in very few places to say, we're going to be showing a 35 millimeter, a beautiful, pristine 35 millimeter print of this film, or like at UCLA where they show a, a nitrate yeah. print of something uh, that will still be the way to go, but it's going to just become more and more rare. And fortunately, the digital products are, are just getting better and better. You know, I remember when Paramount did the digital, its digital restoration of Sunset Boulevard. That was kind of a revelation to me. Yeah. Uh, because it was so good that it was like watching the movie for the first time. I saw there was so much more information in the shadows of that film that came through on the digital version, 4K digital restoration, that didn't come through on the 35 version. In the case of Sunset Boulevard, that was a really good thing. In the case of a lesser made film where they're hiding the fact that it's not a A-list Paramount picture, it can be a, a, a devastating thing because you can see how cheap and tawdry the production actually is, you know, uh, when you get it in high def. But on Sunset Boulevard, it was great because you got to see William Holden's reaction shots and long shot and stuff where you could see the expression on his face that wasn't there necessarily in you know a 35 millimeter print that wasn't beautifully pristine and fresh or freshly struck you know um anyway so i i don't know if that was the answer for christopher but it Everything changes and you really, it is on a case by case basis, you know? And when we pick, like at the festival coming up, if it happens, uh, you know, we have to make those decisions. Like, well, I know this 35 print of Odds Against Tomorrow and it's not good. You, you learn where, you learn the prints, right? This one's coming from this source and blah, blah, blah. And it's just not that good. And in which case, it's like, wow, there's a really good Blu-ray. You know, maybe I'll show that instead. Because the reality is you want the most seamless presentation of the film because you, you want the audience to be into it. You, d you don't want the technical aspects to pull the audience out of the movie.
Yeah. And that, that's that's how I make that decision. Okay, your turn. Okay. Um, one of my uh, one of my favorite contemporary crime fiction writers is Lauren Esselman. Uh, one of his series involves Valentino, the film detective. He seems to be a lot like you. Uh, do you know whether Esselman's character is based in whole or in part on you and your film restoration work? That is Reg in Wooster, Ohio, asking that question. Anne, have you ever read anything by Lauren Esselman? I have not. Uh, Lauren is old school. Lauren is as old school as old school gets. I mean, he still writes on a typewriter, on a manual typewriter. He is prolific beyond belief, writing both crime fiction and westerns. I mean, he, Lauren would have been like fit right in with the old pulp fiction yeah. guys, right? I mean, and I was very, um, so to answer Reg's question, I, I kind of don't know, but I do know Lauren, but I've never actually asked him if Valentino, you know, is me. But I do know for a fact that, because I know Lauren, and I met him when I first started writing crime fiction, and he blurbed my first two books uh, very kindly. He, uh, uh, His wife, Deb, also writes crime fiction. She has a sleuth who is a, a specialist in antiques. Uh, I, uh, Deborah, Deborah Morgan, I believe is her last name. And... Um, Lauren was so fascinated. Uh, he loved Dark City, the lost world of film noir. And, but honestly, so much time has passed, I can't remember the chronology of events. And I do remember my agent at one point telling me I should write a series about a, uh, a film detective. And I didn't do it. And Lauren did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and whether Lauren got the idea of, because he said, "Wow, that's kind of interesting." I will, and I, I, you know, I've read several of the Valentino books, and they're a little tough for me. If Lauren is watching, which which is impossible because he's not on social media or any of this stuff, you know, uh, you know, he doesn't quite get the film stuff, the technical film stuff there's stuff that happens in those books that are like oh shit that would no that would never happen <laughs> not in a not in a million years would that happen uh but the spirit of the books i totally understand and it and it's great fun and lauren just is so prolific that you know he he, he doesn't let anything stand in his way of a good story he just he just rolls right through so um i'm I know I have one of them over here. I can, I think it's called Indigo is the one that I most recently read. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm glad to give a pitch for Lauren's book. So look look them up, you know, E-S-T-L-E-M-A-N, Lauren as in L-O-R-E-N. And uh, yeah, he's terrific. He, he wrote, his detective character is set in Detroit and it's a guy named Amos Walker. And he's... Uh, those are very, very good books. In fact, I stole the title for a chapter in Dark City from one of Lauren's books, Sinister Heights. That was the title of one of his novels. And I just I just purloined that for my own purposes. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. This is Kyle from Long Beach. I was wondering if Eddie can share any information about the Robert Taylor autobiography that he quoted in his Nor Alley intro into Johnny Eager. I've been uh, unable to find even the title of the book. And then secondly, I was wondering if Eddie could share any information about Marsh the Marsha Hunt film, No Place to Hide. It appears to be quite obscure, but it is in Leonard Maltin's movie guide. Um, okay. Uh, yes, the Robert Taylor books uh, are, are not that, they shouldn't be that hard to find. Um, <laughs> I think they both have the same title. There are two of them. Uh, one is called The Life of Robert Taylor, and the author, I think, is named Tranberg. Uh, and the other book is called The Life of Robert Taylor, <laughs> <laughs> but it's written by uh, a woman, Jane yeah. Jane Wayne, I think. 
is the author's name. And I have drawn from from those books. I can't tell which is which, honestly, but um, both for uh, Johnny Eager and for uh, The Bribe, which I showed not that long ago. And um, yeah, so one one I was drawing from about his affair with Lana Turner and the other one I was drawing from about his affair with Ava Gardner. <laughs> poor guy. That and, uh, poor guy, Robert hey, Taylor. Married to Barbara Stanwyck and he's like, come on, come and, uh, on. He was a maroon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, and as, as for the Marsha's uh, film, No Place to Hide, I know of it, but I've never seen it. And I have a sneaking suspicion that um, uh, Kyle is intrigued by it because it's sort of a timely uh, plot. Because it's about, it, it's about germ warfare. And the whole thing was shot in the Philippines. And it's about two kids who who somehow come in possession of these vials of germ warfare that are going to contaminate everything and wipe out humanity as we know it. They're, they're kids, not bats, as in COVID. But, um, and I cannot remember the writer and director's name right now, but I do know that Norman Corwin, the great Norman Corwin, uh, wrote the final screenplay, and I think that's how he and Marsha met. And they ended up doing a lot of work together. They were big uh, United Nations people, and um, yeah, Norman and Marsha were very, very good friends. And I think that making this film is when when they first met. I it, it I've never seen the movie. It is very hard to find. So. Any, anybody who knows anything about it, let me know, because I would love to, to watch it. But, um, you know, it was made very low budget uh, film shot in the Philippines. And I, I think it's like 1955 or 56 or something like that. Oh, me. You. Um, Sorry. Okay, Bill asks, uh, I'd like to ask you both, what is it that you see and hear when you think of film is directed well, okay? Or, or yeah, like what makes a well-directed movie? I, I saw this question when it came across the transom and I yeah. said, oh, this is, this is a good one. I'm gonna enjoy answering this, uh, but I'm gonna let you go. I've talked sufficiently. Do you have any uh, thoughts in this regard, Anne? Yeah, for me, it's a director that puts the emphasis on the story. So I get really, really sucked into what's going on. And I'm not sitting there thinking, wow, this film looks so great. Or, you know what I mean? Or that was so clever or whatever. I like to be completely emotionally sucked in. Um, and I think that in terms of sort of what goes on to make that happen is I've noticed the directors that I'm really drawn to typically work with a lot of the same crew like the work with the same cinematographer and editor a lot. Um, and they work with the same actors a lot. So the people, I mean, I think that's usually the hallmark of, of a good director. And I also honestly think when I hear these stories about different directors just being crappy to their actor, making them do something at like a hundred takes or like, you know, or, or shitty to them because they want to get a performance. It's just like, like learn how to direct actors because you clearly can't do it if you're doing that crap, and I have no respect yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, and I think also um, directors that are also writers, I think, tend to be really good to write, like, at least for me, because I noticed that, like, all, all my favorite directors, almost all of them, like, write their own screenplays, you know? So, yeah, I mean, like I said, for me, it's all about, are they focused on the on the story and how they sell the story. So, um, and sometimes with that, I mean, I I tend to prefer like not to be distracted by like the cinematography and, and the art design, but there are people who like Almodovar and Dario Argento are good examples that use like really extravagant art design and, and camera movement, but it works for the, the stories mm -hmm. that they're telling, mm -hmm. like because they're very visceral stories. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. 
Uh, and I, two cents uh, that is worth more than two cents, far more, because I, I, yeah, I agree very much with what you're saying. And what I, and it's interesting, the way, the way Bill phrased this question, he said, what is it you see and hear? And I would augment that to say, what do I feel? Because I don't specifically, I want to be immersed in the film, right? And I think the, the key factor in that regard is I want to have, I, I want to absorb a feeling of confidence from the way the film is made. There is no right way to make a film, right? There is no technique that I prefer over another technique. There, you know, style for style's sake bores the hell out of me. Just like you're saying, you want commitment to the story, commitment to the actors, all of that. But there's no right way to do it, right? I mean, a, a director like Ozu or someone who barely moves the camera has one way of doing it. And then, you know, you could get something else entirely from, you know, whoever, William Friedkin or, you know, who, who's like, you know, pulling you through the movie and, and, you know, whipping you around. But it's all a sense of confidence that they know what they're doing and they know how to translate that to an audience. And, and to me, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, David Mamet, I remember when I interviewed him, he said, when somebody leaves the movie theater and they say, that was just so beautifully photographed, he said, that's like the most damning criticism a filmmaker yeah. could possibly have. <laughs> you know, if that's the first thing you're taking away from watching the movie is how beautiful it looked, it's like, miss, <laughs> you yeah. screwed something up, you know? Um, and I, and, you know, I've been watching a lot of stuff lately where I just, this point can, you know, I feel this so strongly, like even I, I watch some series, you know, I'll binge watch a series and like one season I'll feel totally like, oh, I'm into this because I feel the director has confidence. And then another series, same characters, everything. And it's like, this this doesn't work they're just there's it's not happening between the script and the direction and they don't really know how they want to approach the material and then it really gets bad when you sense that directors are just throwing stuff out there to in a in a blatant attempt to hold your attention or surprise you with something and it just feels totally incongruous and it's like what's happening why is this happening now you know that that it's no different, honestly, than reading a book. You know, if you read the book and you get lost in the book, that writer's doing their job. And if yeah. the director can just get you into their vision and into the, the, the flow of what they're doing and not make the mistakes that pull you out of it, to me, that's good direction. Yeah. All right, we'll leave that one there. I could go on about that. Me too. Quite for, for an, the rest <laughs> of this and all the other episodes, because yeah. I have a lot of thoughts in that regard. But uh, but that that's pretty much my take. There's no the most important thing to me though is I don't have an idea of like films should be made this way because I don't I just don't believe that. You know? Well, yeah, and sometimes like I'll even dislike like a subgenre. Like I hate found footage horror films. But there's one that I think is really amazing. And Patrick Fabian actually is the star of it. His performance is so great. I think it's also part of why that one is good. Um, well, but, let, let's you know. let's face it, Anne, as you as you well know, you know, the majority of movies are made to cash in. Mm -hmm. The people think there's like, here's an idea that will sell because they right. want to be movie makers. So, you know, the found footage movies became a thing because they could be done so cheaply. But how often do you watch one of those where you feel like you're really in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing? No, they're just doing it because they can get away with it and they talk somebody into it and we'll make some money doing this. 
And then you see the one, exactly. And then you see the one that's like, oh man, they totally understood what they were doing. And, and it's that, it's that sense of confidence that I am, I am handing myself over to somebody who is going to take me on this trip and, and it's going to be worth my time, you know, to, to do this. That, that's yeah. what you want. That's what direction is, right? Yeah, and I think with, you know, with the last exorcism, one, they actually had a good story. Two, it's actually shot in a documentary style, which was actually shot because these people were making a documentary about someone. So it is also shot really well because it looks like a documentary. And also, I mean, let's face it, they got Patrick Fabian before he got famous on Better Call Saul. He's a very good actor, so he could just sell it, you know, because he's playing a Marjo type of kid. It'll remind, it because it's a little bit kind of taken off from the documentary Marjo. Yeah. Two thumbs up. Interesting. Cool. Okay. I'm going to, I will look for that one now. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I saw photos of Eddie recording the Dark City audiobook. Can Eddie please go through the process of recording an audiobook? How long does it take? How do you prepare? Is there much post production work like a music recording? And this is Doug of Doug and Laura. Yes, Doug Grieve. Hi, Doug. How are you? Hey, Doug. Say hi to Laura for me. Um, okay, I this is <laughs> this will be short because I don't. All I know is what I did. Uh, it's in post production now. And I don't know how much of that there's going to be. I have been informed to expect a phone call saying, we need you to go back into the studio on such and such a day to record the pickups of stuff that, you know, aren't 100%. I did absolutely zero preparation for recording this audio book other than writing the book. <laughs> so, so... But I, I say I'm being funny, but also very serious because, man, do I have incredible respect for voice talent now that I've done one of these, right? I mean, yeah, I do TV and stuff, but, you know, when I do Noir Alley, I'm doing, you know, five minutes at a crack and it's just me talking, right? I'm, I'm me. Uh, I didn't realize when I got into this, I said, well, I wrote the book. It'll be simple. I'll just read the book but then you're you're in there you're in the studio and it's all done in a in a you know in a sound studio just like where you would record an album or something and uh you start reading and you realize oh this is now a quote from barbara stanwick what do i yeah. do with that you know do i try to imitate barbara <laughs> stanwick uh you know it, it and it's it's tricky you know and time is of the essence right they blocked out five days <laughs> charlotte is totally bored she's like looking up at the ceiling you know they they blocked out five days for me to do this and you know um we used every minute of every one of those days and you know, the director is in New York and I'm hearing her in my ear giving me directions. And anyway, I don't, I, I'm sure this is boring to most people, but it, it was a real challenge. It was one of the more challenging things that I've done uh, because your mic, like the mic is right here and they want that very, they want that very intimate sound when you're reading the book. Right. Yeah. And what that does when you're mic'd so closely is they hear everything. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, Doug said he saw pictures of me. Well, I'm sure he noticed the clothes I was wearing were all very, very soft. Yeah. Because you can't move at all because the, the microphone will pick that up. I also learned an interesting technique. Uh, I had to eat a lot of apples. Because uh, something about apples, when you eat apples, it it works out your mouth and the apple generates a lot of uh, moisture in your mouth that's good moisture that you don't hear afterwards. So it loosens up your mouth and, and prepares you. And of course, you have to drink all kinds of tea and you have to have 
throat lozenges because any kind of scratchiness, just you hear it instantly. And, you know, I'd give a take that I thought was like, I can't do better than that. And the director would say, we're going to have to do that again because I heard like some, some clicking. Yeah. There's a term clicking that they, you know, which is when you can hear things happening in your mouth <laughs> because you're mic'd so closely. So it was a, it was a challenge, you know. So when people, if they choose to buy this audio book, they will get to hear me uh, doing my best uh, Sterling Hayden impression. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, my best William Powell or, or you no, my John best Dick Houston Powell. Because your John Houston's actually good. Uh, I think I have one John Houston in there, but I was stunned when I started doing it, like how much Sterling Hayden is actually in the book. And, yeah. and because he's such a good writer that I pulled out a lot of quotes from him. And I just, you know, and none of this was practiced. Because I'd get to that point in the book and it would be just like, oh, shit, here comes a bunch of Sterling Hayden, you know. And so you just start doing it. And and the other thing that was interesting was there's not a lot of attaboys in this world, you know. You just do it. And if they, if they don't say stop, do it again, that means you're doing okay. So, <laughs> so, so that's it. You know, I mean, not a, not a lot of back slapping and good job, Eddie. It's just like, just keep talking. Just keep <laughs> talking until we say stop and, and we'll make you do it again. So uh, I, I hope it I hope it turns out OK. That's that's I will say this, though. My reward for finishing five days of recording was to have the engineer because it was just me and this lovely engineer. Her name's Celia. And, and she did all the recording work, and I was exhausted at the end of these five days. And I was in bed on Saturday morning, and Celia texted me and said, eh, I tested positive for COVID last night. So, <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, so I had, to, uh, I had to scramble to get a COVID test before I could do anything else uh, after that. So, fortunately, uh, she's okay, and I was negative, so... Uh, that was a good thing. Uh, okay, uh, Joanne in Portland, Maine, watched Blast of Silence, I guess when I showed it on TCM, and thought it was brilliant. Uh, script, cinematography, narration, everything just fabulous. Um, she had never heard of Mr. Alan Barron before, and now uh, I'm curious about him and his life and would like to know more. Can you share anything more? Um, I don't think I can really get out of the chair, but I have Alan's memoir sitting right over here. So I am going to suggest, um, Joanne, if you really want to know, you can buy Alan's memoir, which is called, not surprisingly, Blast of Silence, uh, on wh wherever you buy books. Uh, and, and I do recommend it. It's really interesting. All I can tell you uh, about Alan, you know, other than that he was a, a actor uh, and a comic book artist uh, before making Blast of Silence. And he, he worked in films and things, but he really only made two feature films that I'm aware of, Blast of Silence and a film made a couple of years after that called Pie in the Sky. And it was reissued under the name, I think, Terror in the City. And it's about a little boy who comes, uh, a, a poor kid from the South who comes to New York and has all of these treacherous adventures. Uh, but it's notable because the stars are Lee Grant is the star of the film and Sylvia Miles is in it as well. Lee Grant plays a prostitute who uh, takes this kid under her wing uh, to help him survive in the big city. Very hard film to find. And after that, Alan basically did television. He, I'm, Alan Barron directed. If you've watched, if you watched any television in the from the '60s through the '80s, uh, episodic television, you probably saw episodes directed by Alan Barron. I mean, he did he did everything: Mannix, Charlie's Angels, Cannon, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, and and he's still he's 92 now, I think, and he 
still lives in Beverly Hills. That's what I can tell you about Alan. <laughs> Somebody's grooming furiously. I know. Uh, this is a, this is mass. Oh, now as I said it, now that I noticed her, she gets down. 